We're going to do something just a little bit different today, but I think it's absolutely appropriate considering the season we're in. For generations, Christians have often read the gospel from the center of the room, whether they were in a sanctuary, in someone's home, wherever they were meeting, and everyone turned toward the reading of the gospel and gathered around it like a family. And this is not just a formality, but it is a reminder. The act itself preaches that Emmanuel, God with us, is not far away, but has come down to join us where we are. That light that is sent isn't coming from a safe distance, but he has become one of us, joined us in our need. And because of Christ, there is no barrier none at all to his love. So this is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we're going to invite our kids to continue their worship and learning in the Children's Worship Center. If you're going out these doors back here, go up one level to our atrium. And from the balcony, it's directly out and toward the right. And we bless you guys as you go. And everyone else, I'm going to invite you to have a seat and then awkwardly turn to someone near you and say, the light has come. <laughs> oh, come on. Do you believe it? <laughs> Get my act together up here. Well, Welcome once again to this fourth Sunday of Advent in which our theme, as you've heard in song and in the scripture reading and in prayer and in the lighting of our candle, the theme is love. And I, for some reason, I don't see us often using Joseph as an example of this, but he's such a good one if we're paying attention to this scripture. The gospel writers don't give us many specifics about Joseph at all, really. Not much is written or known about him, but this passage in Matthew tells us so much about who he was. The Gospel of Luke gives us the most backstory and context for the birth of Jesus, of course, and appropriately focuses on Mary. We get the whole story of Mary. We get the story of Elizabeth and Zachariah and um, John the Baptist and Mary, and we get her Magnificat, which uh, Jen read last week where she bursts out in worship and devotion to what God is doing. But the book of Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus, starting with Abraham, going through David, and leading up to Joseph. Matthew calls him, did you notice, a son of David. So in addition to the blood kinship with David's line through Mary that Luke gives us, Matthew establishes Jesus' legal status as an heir of David, 
through his adopted earthly father, Joseph. The, the genealogies might seem boring to read, except to us nerds, but they definitely have purpose. And in addition to calling him a son of David, Matthew's gospel tells us that Joseph was, what did he say about him? A just man, a just man. And then he immediately gives an example to qualify this statement. That's what I want to look at. But first we need to understand Joseph's predicament within his own culture. Mary was betrothed to Joseph, which is sometimes translated engaged, but in our culture, engagements can be broken off without a whole lot of difficulty. I mean, there's typically heartbreak involved. I'm not trying to diminish that, but it's not that difficult to break an engagement. But in ancient Judaism, betrothal was a legal pledge and was as binding as marriage. Like any legal contract, there was typically financial exchange between the families, such as a bride price or a dowry. So betrothals, like a marriage, required a certificate of divorce to be broken. And there were, there were ramifications for everyone involved. So my point in clarifying this is that Joseph's plan to reduce the shame of Mary's premarital pregnancy in that culture by divorcing her privately would have cost him in this society. See, whatever financial pledge he had already made to the family would have been returned to him if he had taken her to court publicly. But that's not guaranteed otherwise. And maybe more importantly in the culture, he could make a public repudiation of her, making it clear that he was not the child's father and distancing himself from her. And this would have ensured that his own shame was reduced by publicly shaming her. And don't we see that all around us? Trying to divert, point the finger, so the spotlight's not on our issues? <laughs> we see it all around us. But not Joseph. Joseph seems more concerned with protecting what remained of Mary's honor than with increasing his own. Because by, grant, by granting her a divorce quietly, he would have reduced the attention drawn to her pregnancy. Now remember, this is before the angel told him to do anything. This was his plan. This was his choice. And so I think here we see why Matthew calls him a just man. I think we can also see that Joseph probably already loved Mary. What I want us to begin to hear today is that showing real love costs. Love isn't self-beneficial, but it's self-sacrificing. Love does not insist on its own way. That's what Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, was saying on that beautiful chapter in love which Noah recited today. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is kind. I see so much kindness in Joseph's act here. Then, as Joseph is considering how to go about all this, the angel appears to him in a dream with this incredible revelation about Mary and the child she carries telling him not to fear. Here we have further evidence of Joseph being a just man in his obedience. In obeying the angel's direction, he was making a bigger and more costly commitment by embracing Mary rather than divorcing her, even quietly. Instead of clearing his own name, it would now be assumed that he had gotten her pregnant before the wedding, leaving them both, not just Mary, but both of them together as objects of gossip in this small town for years to come. Anybody from a small town? Does word get around? Once it gets around, does it stay around? So you know what we're dealing with here. Making this choice would cost Joseph much more than his initial intention to quietly divorce her. But he obeyed God's voice through the angel. 
He chose to be present with her because love bears all things, not just the good times. So this final Sunday of Advent is focused on love as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. And in Joseph, I pray that we see obedience and goodness motivated by love, love in self-sacrifice, love in being present without concern for self-benefit. Please hear me if you don't hear anything else today. Hear this. Joseph joined Mary in her vulnerable position rather than rejecting her. How could he have ever imagined that in the adopted son he chose to help raise, God was and is doing the same thing for the entire world, joining us in our vulnerability rather than rejecting us? Joseph himself, like so many before him, became a foreshadowing of Christ, a foreshadowing of the son he's about to help raise. And Matthew tells us the ancient prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled in Jesus, calling him, as we read, Emmanuel, God with us. God chose to join us in our predicament rather than leave us alone. Like Joseph, God's love personified in Jesus, is present with, us through, present with us through it all, and it cost him everything. Love joins us in our vulnerability and need rather than rejecting us. That is the person and the work of Emmanuel. As we celebrate Christmas, we're focused on Christ's coming to be one of us, like as I've just said. But he didn't just join us and leave us as we are. The angel tells Joseph to name Mary's son Jesus, which means God saves. And as we know, he would do just that by giving it all, his life, because love costs. God is, w think of these names of this baby that Joseph has chosen to help raise. God is with us, and God saves. He is with us and he saves us. We had to sing it again today because we're just not hearing it. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. You give yourself away. Our kids saying there is no dwelling too low for him for welcome is all he wants. Into the heart he will bring his peace. His love is for everyone. Everyone. But the question is, can we receive such love? Can we receive it? And if so, can we offer this love we have received? We are called to embody this same love because that is what Christ asks of us who claim to follow him. On the night before he died in John 15, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. That is the call and the command of Christ to those who follow him. Laying down our lives Joseph laid down his life. Physical death is not the only way we, down, we lay down our lives, is it? What about death to our own self-interest? What about laying down our own need to have our expectations fulfilled in the way that we expect? Those are kinds of death. It's the kind of death we're called to as followers of Christ for the sake of love. Joseph laid down his life and what would have been a much easier life on him, at least early on, for Mary and Jesus. Jesus, And he is our example because real love and obedience to Christ's command to love others will cost us as it cost him. 
And don't we come up with millions of ways to avoid Jesus' clear teaching to love one another? We have received everything, and yet it's so easy for us to come up, just to be distracted. There's millions of distractions, of programs, of events, of strategies, and, and, and all this within the church. I'm not just talking about our own lives. Within the church, strategies and ways to witness rather than following Jesus in self-sacrificing love for one another, which is what he told his disciples was the true witness to the world of who he is. Our love for one another is the witness not our stances, not our Facebook posts. Our love for one another is how the world can know who Jesus really is. Let that sink in. There's no other way. It's not a difficult strategy. It's clear. Die for love as I have. Is what the Lord is asking us to do. Um, on the first week of Advent, Pastor Ben asked us to write two related things down on either side of an index card. Where do we need hope in our lives and how can we offer hope to others? Because see, what we can and cannot receive and what we can and cannot offer are deeply connected, aren't they? If we can't receive true hope from the Lord, we really don't have hope to offer. And it's the same with peace, as Pastor Greg preached, and it's the same with joy, as Pastor Jen preached last week, and it is the same with love. We heard Paul's incredible definition of love earlier from Noah. It's not just something we recite at weddings, folks. After this incredible chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, do you know what the next two words are? The first two words in chapter 14? Pursue love. Not just recite it, not just say amen to a sermon. Pursue love. So folks, as I start to wrap up and we begin to come to the table, how can we show this kind of self-sacrificing love this Christmas season? this coming year, in our families, in our workplace. Like Joseph, can we learn to not run away from others' needs or distance ourselves from their concerns? But instead, can we be present with others? For Christ, Emmanuel, is present with us. A steadfast and faithful presence with no thought of reciprocity. No thought of our own benefit. Looking to diminish others' shame and join others in their need. This is what Christ does for us and this is what he asks us to do for others. Like the words we heard in our opening prayer. And I'll close with this so that we can come to the table. The opening prayer that was led as we lit the Advent candle is a very old prayer attributed to St. Francis. And I want you to listen to all of our Advent themes in this prayer. Let us open our hearts and minds to hear these words and to act on these words. Draw us into your love, Christ Jesus, and deliver us from fear. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying 
that we are born to eternal life.